My name is Nigel Griffiths. I work in IBM Power Systems Advanced Technology Support in Europe. In this short video, we're going to be looking at the VIO server feature called Shared Storage Pools Phase 3. This is also known and written down as SSP3. This came out at the end of 2012. All the new features of the SSP3 is delivered with the new VIO server. So you just install the latest version or you upgrade to the 2221 version of the virtual IO server. Very well worth reading these uh, readme notes and I'll put this URL up on the wiki site and have a look through the user guide. This is actually a collection of the manual pages but I find it easier to read it as a book. We'll look at some of the readme details and I'll highlight some of the new features. From the readme notes, there's no change with the support for Power 6, 7 and the blades. For the actual pool we have this thing called a repository. Uh, we're now allowed to go down to 1 gigabyte. There's more than enough space for that uh, particular LUN. Then we have the data LUNs. It says start from 10 gigabytes in practical terms. We want a few terabytes uh, in here or at least a terabyte to use it as a reasonable size pool to support lots of clients. Uh, it says we're meant to be using a RAID under the covers. I can't see any reason for not doing that. That tends to be the natural way of doing things on a SAN storage subsystem. Still need the uh, name resolution to resolve the uh, host names uh, because this is a network cluster and we've got to have that working. Again, the same details for the uh, virtual I.O. server size. Um, shared and uncapped uh, sounds reasonable to me. Um, it's basically saying don't use a very skinny VIO server. Uh, you know, make it a reasonable size because it is actually going to do some more work uh, running the shared storage pool. Let's look at the increased limits that we have with this release. The first number there, I want to highlight this, is the maximum number of VIO servers is 16. That's a proper size cluster. Note though, if you're using dual VIO servers, that's really down to eight different uh, machines. But again, that's a proper size cluster. That's the sort of cluster which you could pull together and say, OK, all the logical partitions in these eight machines will be using the shared storage pool, and they can then use live partition mobility across that cluster. We could move all the LPARs from one machine out of eight, um, provided we're not in a busy period of the year, uh, and then we could take that machine down for maintenance or uh, uh, putting extra resources, uh, memory for example, in the machine or adapters, and then we could bring the machine back up again and move the logical partitions back to it. All the other things have changed uh, by a factor of uh, four or eight. So you can see the maximum number of disks there is now a thousand that uh, go in the pool. The number of logical units is 8,000, uh, that's more than enough I think there. And the VA server or VA server pair um, it can have 200 uh, logical partitions. Uh, again, that's more than enough for most people. Uh, the actual size of the pool, the maximum then of the uh, LUNs put into the pool is 16 terabytes, it's quite big. And the pool itself total can be 512 terabytes, or half a pentabyte. We're talking about seriously big pools. And all these numbers are the numbers that have been tested at the AIX and Virtual IO server labs. Um, so these are testing limits. We can probably go higher than this if you really want to, but do get in contact uh, and let us work with you if that's the case. The actual logical units, the LUs that you give to a client, uh, can be up to uh, 4 terabytes. We still have the one repository disk uh, limit, but there are new recovery options. Finally, in the README, there's a few restrictions. You can see a lot of blank space on this slide as I've deleted some of them as they've removed them, and they've dropped them from this uh, release. Uh, they're not really restrictions, some of them are just uh, notes really. Um, the network has to be reliable to run a cluster, that's a given really, isn't it? Um, so you want uh, DNS to work, reverse and forward lookups, and synchronizing clocks, that sort of thing. Uh, there's some other things that are just practical uh, details in here. There's also a recommendation of uh, the fact that you can now use a dedicated network for the SSP uh, network traffic, and that uh, means that you're not going to be running over a user side congested network and so your cluster will never have a problem. We'll look at that in a minute. Now when it comes to using the cluster, uh, the cluster correct command is exactly the same as it was before. I think it started up a little bit quicker but I didn't actually measure it. Um, also note that there's the uh, clean disk commands if you're using a LUN that's already in use uh, in the past and is now empty. 
um, it restores some information in the uh, header of the disk and we can clean that out with a clean disk command. Then we add the other nodes of the cluster. Of course now we go up to 16 so that you can run this command 15 other times to get your cluster up to the full size. The cluster command has the cluster list and cluster status. This is all exactly the same as the previous release. Then we start allocating space to the clients and again that's exactly as it was in the previous release. If we look at the list storage pool command, uh, things have changed in here. We've got some two more columns that are particularly uh, good. And here we have the percentage used and the unused. So we can see up here that we allocated 32 gigabytes to my Orange 7 LPAR and I give it a second disk of 32 gigabytes as well. And we can see the first one is 9% used. This is the unused space, uh, 29 gigabytes. Rather than us having to do the maths all the time, 9%. I can deal with that a lot simpler. You can also see that I haven't used the uh, second disk uh, yet at all, uh, which is good to know. Maybe I can free that up if I never actually get around to using it. It also has um, some things in the uh, less detailed, the cluster overview. Here we have the total of all the spaces uh, that have been allocated uh, down here. We can see how much is actually used. It's um, 5 gigabytes or so. But we have this new extra column here, which is the overcommit size. Um, at the moment, all, if all the LUs are fully used, I'm not going to have any problems with space because I'm not overcommitted. But if I'm starting to overcommit these, assuming that not everybody's going to use their disk space, then there is a worst case scenario that if they start using their disk space, then we're going to hit a problem. And it's telling me how much of a problem I get. A little bit of a reminder, but there's now four different user interfaces to SSP. There's the command line, and um, in the early days and when things are simple, I tend to have used the command line. There are some features that uh, will always make sense to do on the command line, like the cluster create and the add node sort of operations. You do these rarely, you want to make sure that they've worked and you can test them on the command line. And I can't see that changing, even if there was a more fancy graphical user interface for creating clusters. Next there's the config assist, which is the VO server uh, version of Smitty and everything we do in the command line I think we can do in config assist. Up to you whether you like that or, or not. Sometimes it's useful to go in there just to check um, if you understand that all the various uh, options you haven't missed a trick. There's also the graphical user interface on the HMC to access the shared storage pools. I actually quite like this when I'm making uh, additions to my clients. I actually quite often go in here. It's a lot quicker than logging into the VIO server and uh, fiddling about. We also now have Systems Director. This is new in SSP3 and we've got a couple of slides describing these new features coming up. Okay, so here's my HMC running 776. This all starts working on 774. It's my list of uh, servers in here. It's my diamond machine. I've selected it already. If we go down here, let's go down configurations, virtual resources, and then go to virtual storage management. We'll bring up the panel. So here we can select uh, either the shared storage pool directly. I prefer to look at a particular VIO server. So select that and run query. Okay, now you can see there's no virtual disks in here. Uh, that's because I'm using uh, the shared storage pool for all of my uh, logical partitions now. And um, if we then want to uh, see what's going on, you'll notice a new little thing down in here, easy to overlook, show shared storage pool storage. So click yes on that. I see, whoa, there's a whole load of things in, the, in here. And we can see here for the these are the, just the names, my naming convention in here. The Diamond 3 is the LPAR, and we're on the machine called Diamond. And we can see which they're being connected uh, to. Uh, be careful, though. Some of these things down here say, like, Gold 2. Gold is another machine. It says none down here, even though it is connected on the uh, Gold machine. Remember, we were just looking at the Diamond Virtual I.O. server here. And we can scroll down and see all the other things in here. And if I wanted to just add uh, a second disk to perhaps one of my... LPARs, then perhaps a Diamond 8 in here, so I'll create virtual disk. 
and we're going to give it a name. Okay, this is my uh, storage pool in here. You can see that I've also got a storage pool which is the root VG. We don't want to be using that. Um, it was 16 gigs, so let's give him another 16 gig to keep things uh, nice and symmetrical. Sign it to a partition. There's my diamond eight, and it's look this up. It says, "Oh, this is connected to both VIO servers. Do you want me to dual path that?" Well, yes, please. And we have a choice here of thick or thin provisioning. Thin looks good to me. And we'll just hit OK. You can see it's creating the virtual disk. It's a command that takes one or two seconds, and now it's requerying the VO server to make sure it's got the latest config in my uh, panel here. And we can see 8B is here, it's, it's all connected up for us. Now I can log on to Diamond 8 on Config Manager and it'll say, yep, there's another disk and I can start using it. Now before we go and look at Systems Director and some of the new features there, a quick reminder of the fact that we now have lots of VO servers in our shared storage pool cluster. It opens up uh, some other possibilities that we haven't really thought about before. In this diagram here on the left hand side, we have a shared storage pool with two VIO servers and different machines uh, connected to its LAN disks. Then on the right hand side we have the standard either virtual SCSI or NPIV type disks directly connecting the client's disks to the LUNs at the back. Now we can use live partition mobility. Uh, first of all we can do that across the uh, cluster uh, to the VIO servers that are equally in the pool, in the same pool. Um, or, as we have been doing for many years now, using live partition mobility, NPIV to another VO server that also has a connection to the same disks at the back end. It's zoned in so it can uh, access the disks. Now there's a third possibility here. We can have one VO server that's using all sorts of disk technologies. In fact, it could also be using the uh, internal disks of the uh, VO server to its direct attached disk adapters. But in this case we have a VO server that is part of a pool and um, so we have a client here using that and we have a client that's using uh, virtual SCSI that's uh, actually landing in the VO server and then using virtual SCSI to get to the client or using NPIV and a virtual fiber connection at the bottom in here. But when I was talking to my wingman Gareth uh, in ATS um, that wasn't obvious that we could do that um, and then there's some more complicated scenarios about live partition mobility. We can, of course, use uh, live partition mobility across the pool, as we saw in the previous diagram, and their clients for the virtual SCSI LUNs and the MPIV LUNs, they can go to another VIO server. Maybe, though, we need to highlight what we can't do. In this case, the client up here is using a disk that's part of the uh, pool, and it can't be moved to a VIO server that is not part of the pool. That may be uh, fairly obvious to you. Um, and the clients that are using the direct LUNs, uh, they can't move to this VO server because this VO server is only part of the pool. It doesn't understand how to get access to the virtual SCSI LAN and the MPIV LAN. Now then, we've got some other options in here. So if we had a scenario uh, like this, again, we got a pool over here on the left and we've got the regular disks in here, and we actually have our local bright yellow disk over here. Now if we wanted to move this client so that it starts using the shared storage pool technology, um, we can't do live partition mobility because its disks are either local to the VO server or in these particular areas here, and they're not part of the pool. So what could we actually do? Well, if we zoned in this VIO service and it became part of the pool, um, then at least the, this VO server can see the right disks. Now we create uh, some disk space in the pool and assign it to that client. So the client sees these extra disks. Um, they have to be made big enough to uh, match the other sorts of disks in this client. Then we do a um, mirroring of the disks so that they're uh, in sync with each other. Then we can do the boss boot and the boss list command and then break the mirrors. So now we end up with just the new um, disks that are supported from the sand pool. And now we can do a live partition mobility across the shared storage pool. This um, increases the flexibility as we can now 
you move the client virtual machine to any VO server in the pool without worrying about any zoning sort of uh, considerations. Uh, and it makes life uh, a lot more simple. At the back end, we haven't got these private LUNs for our clients to deal with anymore. Now that we have 16 VO servers in a pool, we could use this to temporarily adopt a VO server, absorb its clients, use live partition mobility to move them off the machine, uh, and then free up the uh, resources, and then move the shared storage pool away from the VI server. So we could use this to mop up lots of small client virtual machines and move them to uh, other machines and using the uh, pool feature. Uh, I like to think of this as you will be assimilated. Another possibility we need to uh, think about is the fact that uh, at the moment we've tended to connect it up the cluster across the network across the uh, sort of site LAN in the computer room but we now have this extra ability to create a VIO server cluster only LAN a sort of private LAN for these VIO servers um, we then set up routes so that we get to the VIO servers over this new network interface uh, but of course this isn't anything we need to do with uh, shared storage clusters, this is just regular uh, networking uh, configuration. I asked the SSP guys, uh, you know, where is this documented, and they said, well, this is just standard network uh, features. They just stated in the release notes that this is now tested and supported. Uh, and this means we have a nice um, network that will never get over busy so the cluster can always talk to themselves and uh, never run into problems. I quite like this idea if we've got uh, some spare network ports on the back of our VO servers to use them in this way. I find a lot of customers use a configuration like this. They use a dual VO server for production workloads and a separate pair of virtual I.O. servers for all the other workloads. And they asked me then, how am I going to apply a shared storage pool to this and keep the production separated uh, from the other workloads? Well, it might not be obvious because all my slides tend to have the storage pool, but we can, of course, have multiple storage pools, even on the same machine at the same time. But a single VIO server can only be in one shared storage pool. But in this example, we have one group of VIO servers which are production use, and it makes sense to have a shared storage pool for production. And then we have a different set of virtual I.O. servers that can be in a different pool, keep the disks separate, the VIO servers separate, and we can then use a different pool for that. And that boosts the number of machines we actually cater for in a single shared storage pool. This gives us the separation, and it gives us a nice big clusters. So let's finish off now looking at shared storage pools and systems director. Now ISD, IBM Systems Director, with its VM Control plugin, already has a feature of storage pools, and the SSP appears as just another storage pool like the VO server internal disks and logical volumes on there, or LUNs in a SAN disk subsystem. To get this running, you need Systems Director 62 or higher, and VM Control uh, 242 or higher. These all became available 14th of December. 2012. Now it has some unique features in here that uh, we're going to highlight. I've got a big diagram on the next slide, but we have a special agent uh, for the VIO server for SSP support. Once you've installed that, then VM Control can discover the shared storage pool during the inventory of the VIO server. Then you can use VM Control to capture an SSP client virtual machine, and it's then called an appliance that you can then deploy out. Uh, deploy onto the same shared storage pool, and you'll, you'll see why in the diagram. Now when it does that, um, we're using a very clever technique, uh, the disk space is allocated via linked cloning. And this is like taking a snapshot, and then the two logical partitions, or client virtual machines, they actually run on the same set of disk blocks. Of course, um, when one of them writes to a disk, it then has to be uh, split off, so there's two copies of it. But any disk blocks that they don't actually write to, like the bulk of the operating system, um, will actually be the same block um, on the shared storage pool, thus saving even more disk space, even more than we have with um, thin partitioning already. Now the other thing is, because we're using these linked cloned features, um, we don't actually have to allocate or 
copy or duplicate any uh, disk blocks to actually start up a new logical partition. So we actually can co create the linked clone in a couple of seconds. So we have very fast creating of our uh, client virtual machine and we're going to start it up um, only when it writes to the blocks we'll actually have to copy some disk space. Um, it also uses this thing called an activation engine. We've uh, seen that in the past when we've done things like the storage copy services way of creating or deploying an appliance. Um, this means that when you start up this little bit of software will actually run and it does the uh, making the original and the new logical partition have different host names and IP addresses and security keys and all that sort of thing. So here we have my nice big diagram. I'll walk you around this. Fortunately there's some numbers to follow. So initially we'll start up if we haven't already got systems director running and we'll Install that, set it up, and add the VM control plugin. Then, as normal, we'll get the systems director to discover and do an inventory of the HMCs. Number three is up here. We'll add the VO servant already has a common agent installed. Maybe we need to uh, update that. Then we need the uh, VM control agent because the VO server will be a repository. Then we're going to add this new SSP agent so that systems director can understand the share storage pool. Then when we got the agents uh, installed we do a discover and an inventory and now the system director will, will find out about the shared storage pool just like the other pools uh, in the past. Number four down here is then we actually then want to actually connect to the uh, client as an endpoint as the system director calls everything it's talking to. Um, it will have a common agent on it of course and we'll do a discover and inventory of that. Now, when we want to use this client virtual machine as the um, master image of an appliance that we then want to duplicate out with deployment, then we're going to set it up the way we uh, like it. So we might as well install lots of uh, features and you know, backups and uh, any common software that we want on our image. Then we set up the activation engine and stop the client. Uh, we want to do the cloning with the um, client virtual machine down so we don't have to do any disk recovery and when we start it up as a copy. Number six then is up in here so we use the VM control uh, feature as we have in the past, a capture. Um, we say that we want to put the appliance into the uh, shared storage pool and it will know what to do and it's going to do this, uh, this is the disk in here for our master copy it's actually going to take a complete copy of all the disk space there and it has this then this master set up in here that it will be actually be using to run the uh, the next set of uh, client virtual machines next then we're going to use the uh, deploy feature of VM control to create the appliance it's going to then use a linked clone of this uh, copy up the top here and um, there's no copying to do at that point to actually create the link clone um, because it's going to share all the blocks until one of the uh, users of those blocks actually does a write to it and then it will split off a, a unique copy. Uh, number eight then is that when we've asked for the deploy uh, in the background VM controller is going to create the logical partition or client VM, um, allocate the CPU memory network and disk setup, connects to the shared storage pool uh, linked clone. Um, and then when we start it up as the final process, then the activation engine kicks in and gives us the uh, unifiedation. So we have our host names and IP addresses and security all set up, and we're running on a shared set of disks in the shared storage pool. Well, that's my quick look at shared storage pools phase three. And uh, as a result of this, I want you to uh, get all excited about this, start negotiating a few terabytes off your uh, sound team. Uh, get your VO server up to 2221 on your Power 6 and 7 machines and then think how you can start adopting uh, logical partitions and how everybody's going to benefit from using live partition mobility. At the very least this will give you the flexibility to migrate your LPARs from a machine so you can upgrade your firmware regularly. Don't forget Firmware on our power machines is the hypervisor where a lot of new features are actually added at that low level. And so live partition mobility isn't really an option. It's something you should have been doing five years ago. Okay, thank you for your time.